Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening. This is uh, my name is Chris Holden, and it's a pleasure to be able to welcome you and thank you for joining us today as we count down to Mars. Uh, we are less than two days away to witness NASA's Mars 2020 rover Perse Perseverance landing. The landing will represent another milestone in the his human history and space history and an amazing technological feat full of imagination, determination, and reflection of our world's greatest minds. It is my pleasure to partner with NASA's JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, to highlight extraordinary scientists and gifted thinkers who insist on pushing the theological, technological envelope. From the earliest versions of the automobile, a steam-powered engine attached to a buggy, to the mighty locomotives of the Transcontinental Railroad, the Model T and the Saturn V rocket that put a man on the moon. Scientists have always sought to create newer, better, faster ways to travel and explore the world and universe around us. The group of scientists joining me today build upon this legacy and I am honored to have so many of them living and working in my district at the Jet, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. From those humble beginnings, JPL has grown to become the leading space exploration research facility in the world. This never ending quest for knowledge fueled this team's effort toward expanding humanity's knowledge of the solar system, making significant progress towards answering the questions of whether life exists beyond our own planet. Thanks to their creativity and determination, these extraordinary scientists have pushed the technological limits of innovation to continue the legacy of humanity's quest for scientific discovery and exploration. It's my pleasure to feature them here tonight. And so I'm going to introduce our first uh, presenter, uh, Dr. Randy Wesson. Uh, Dr. Wesson has been an employee of NASA's JPL since 1984. He is currently the lead study architect for JPL's Innovation Foundries A team. Prior to this, Dr. Wesson has worked with several missions and program areas at JPL, including system engineer in the aerospace, aerophysics division, telecommunications and mission systems manager of the Cassini science planning and operations, the Galileo deputy sequence team chief and the Voyager science sequence coordinator for Uranus and Neptune encounters. Dr. Wesson, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, let's just get into it. So I'm going to share my screen and then take you guys on a journey. So let me pull up my first slide. There we go. What I'd like to do is take you on a journey, and this is our next journey to our next target, Mars. We've been doing a number of these things, but I really want to give you the, a sense of the excitement and why we're actually doing this thing that will begin on Mars starting Thursday, right after lunch. So in this cartoon right here, you can see a, a cartoon of the Perseverance rover on Mars doing what it's going to do when it's there, but I'm not gonna tell you what that is quite yet. Let me first back up and take you on a journey about Mars. In this diagram, we have both Earth and Mars to scale and basically you can see right off the bat that Mars, the one on the right, the brown guy, that's about half the size of Earth. A uh, couple of prominent features on it, right in the middle you can see this horizontal line. That's Valles Marineris, it's the largest canyon in the solar system, and if you put that on the Earth, the Grand Canyon can hold a candle to it. This thing would stretch from coast to coast across the United States. The other features are these four volcanoes, Three of them are the small ones. They're only about the size of Mount Everest, but the really large one, that's three times the size of Everest and has a footprint the size of the state of Arizona. Now, we've been to Mars already a number of times, and the approach initially was follow the water. Where there's water, we think there's life. And one of the questions we've always had is, was Mars ever alive? Now, in these three pictures on the left, you see that's the surface of Mars it really looks like it's a dried riverbed. On the right, 
you see a little snapshot of the south polar region of Mars. And we know Mars has dry ice, carbon dioxide, and water ice. The weird one is the one in the middle, and your eyes aren't fooling you. You're actually seeing water vapor clouds moving in the sky. And this was from one of our rovers taking their camera and looking up and just watching the brief clouds go by. So even though the atmosphere is very, very thin, there still is a little bit of water in there. It's very dry, but there still is some water. All this basically tells us that we really believe Mars in its distant past really was wet. So we think it had oceans. Now, this is a map of Mars. We just rolled it out. It's called a Mercator projection. Black line in the middle is the equator, but this was color coded. Anything that is red to white and orange, that's high level stuff. That's high altitude plains or mountain peaks. When you get to greens and blues, those are really shallow regions. And one of the things we noticed, other than that big crater in the Southern hemisphere, the south part appears to be all orangey and yellow, which tells us it's high plateaus uh, and it's cratered. If you look above the equator, the northern part, you can see it's blue. It's really low down and there are very few craters. Um, what happened to the craters in the northern hemisphere and why is it so low? We believe that the craters, something either prevented them from occurring or erased them, and the reason why the scientists actually color-coded the map this way is that we think Mars, three, three and a half billion years ago, had a north polar sea. So all that was below sea level, and that protected the ground from the impacts and erased whatever was there. So you can see how in the middle, water would have flown through the Valles Marineris into the North Seas. And in this image, you can see where other spacecraft have landed. The red dot to the right where I'm pointing right now that's the Jezero crater. That's our target. We're coming in on Thursday. Now, when you first look at these rovers, you're going to go, wow, Mars 2020, which is now called Perseverance, and MSL, which is the Mars Science Laboratory, which we now call Curiosity. Uh, you go, wow, they look the same. Are they the same? Well, they're pretty much the same size. Perseverance is a little bit heavier. It's about 300 pounds, and it's a little bigger but it's got a completely different set of science objectives than Curiosity. Curiosity was a mobile lab to look for things with carbons and hydrogens we call organics. It was looking for, was the building blocks for life present on Mars at one point? Mars 2020, Perseverance, its job is, is twofold. One, it's looking for habitability. Could things live there? So just because you have organic compounds, carbon and hydrogens, it doesn't mean it could survive there or actually grow to evolve to something that's maybe life-like. This thing is going to look for habitability. So it's either, is there life there today? Or was there life in the distant past? It's not clear we're going to find, uh, I mean, we have no idea about whether there's life there or not. But right now we're looking, could life survive there? And that's what we mean by habitability. Well, this is a cartoon with the seven science instruments. And I just want to point out that we have a mast with a number of cameras. We have a weather station. On the arm, we have a, a bunch of instruments to look, as I said, for the elements and compounds. We have a radar to go through the ground. And we have an oxygen generator to see if we can actually make oxygen for future missions. Uh, one of the things I was really impressed with, we have a whole lot of cameras on this thing. There is 16 cameras just on the rover itself. You have another seven that were used as we come in through the atmosphere. And then we have another two on one of the fun payloads we're taking, which is this, it's a helicopter. So this is first the entry. This is what's gonna happen Thursday. It's gonna be seven minutes, we hit the atmosphere, we throw off the, the uh, crew stage, which was powering the vehicle. And now we're steering as we go through the atmosphere and we heat up almost 3,000 degrees. So we're just coming through there. Once we slope it up, out comes a hypersonic parachute, which holds us. We then let loose the, the heat shield. Come on, let loose the heat shield. We're blown in the wind. There goes the heat shield, exposing the rover underneath. There goes the heat shield. We now drop the rover. 
with this descent stage. And the descent stage is guiding the rover to a desired landing site, both in the region we want, the Jezero Crater, and a safe region in the Jezero Crater. Once we get close, we take the rover and we lower it down, and then we gently place it on the surface, cut the cords, and then we leave. And run Mars. Piece of cake. That should happen around 12.50 on Thursday. Here's the Jezero Crater. So here's a picture of what it looks like. Uh, I'm going to show you a little square we're going. You can see it almost looks like there was a river channel coming into this thing, a dried river channel. If I do a close-up of that box, it looks like this, and you can see there's that river channel. It really looks like a dried river delta, which means maybe it was wet, maybe had life, maybe had examples of fossilized life in this river delta region, and this is where we're going on Thursday. Finally, one of the experiments we're getting to do is we're dropping a helicopter called Perseverance. It's about four pounds. It's got two propellers. We're going to back away about the size of a football field to actually be a safe distance, and then we're going to watch it and see if we can actually fly in an alien world's atmosphere. Now, we have five flight tests. We've done this here at JPL uh, in a tank that tried to simulate Mars conditions, but this will be the first flight of a powered vehicle on another planet. It's got two cameras, so it'll take pictures along the way, and it'll communicate back to the rover, and then the rover will send the data back to us. One of the last things, when I talked about two major things of the Perseverance, one was habitability. It's also going to collect more than 30 samples of rocks, put them in tubes for future missions. So what we believe is, or the plan is, Perseverance is going to collect samples, drive around, collect them, seal them in tubes, place them on the surface of Mars. And then sometime in the mid-2020s, you'll have two missions. One on the left would have a rover, we call the fetch rover, that would pick up these samples and bring it back to this lander, which has a rocket on top of it. It would load those tubes onto the rocket. The rocket would blast off the surface of Mars and putting those tubes, which are in a canister, in orbit around Mars. And then from Mars, this little white circle, that's that canister with the samples that Perseverance collected. There'll be another spacecraft that will actually rendezvous with those samples, collect them, and then bring them back to Earth so that we can have the first samples from Mars that haven't been disrupted getting to Earth violently as a meteorite. I'd like to end now with a quote by one of my heroes, Konstantin Edvardovich Tsiolkovsky. The Earth is the cradle of the mind, but one cannot live in the cradle forever. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wesson. Anytime. You know, it's really, it, it's really fascinating um, just seeing the animation that of how the rover will make its way into the atmosphere and then ultimately onto the ground. And when you think about you're essentially slingshotting something across the universe and <laughs> <It's more. laughs> pointing it right into a particular area on a planet, knowing exactly where you need it to land and being able to hit. I mean, if I had accuracy like that when I was playing basketball, I'd still be in the, I'd be in the NBA by You'd now. You'd be in the NBA. Yeah. You'd yeah. be in a league of your own. Yes, but it's incredibly fascinating. We'll have some questions for you because we had people actually call, um, send questions in earlier and a lot of what okay. you laid out in your presentation, uh, there will be questions that will line up with that. So thank you for again being here and for your great presentation. Um, you we're it. also pleased to have with us um, Dr. Mujike Cooper. Uh, Dr. Cooper received her BA in physics from Hampton University in 2006. She then enrolled at Drexel University where she received her master's and PhD in mechanical engineering with a concentration in thermal fluid science. I was gonna do that one, but I decided business <laughs> <was> marketing. <laughs> right. They didn't need another one person out there with that one going for them. Um, her dissertation studies involved non-equilibrium plasma sterilization of spacecraft materials. So it was a logical transition to work for the Jet Propulsion Laboratory Planetary Protection Group. She was involved in the Mars 2020 mission where she is the lead planetary protection 
and looks forward to leading the next endeavor with the Europa Lander concept. She's also involved in a Mars sample return related project where she is developing sterilization capabilities for a possible return sample from Mars. I, you know how I know that both of you are so smart because it's hard enough for me just to read your bio. <laughs> Can you tell anyway, like that? <laughs> we, we thank you for being here and we appreciate your participation in our, on our presentation tonight. So welcome. Yeah, thank you, it's my pleasure. So I'm going to share my screen now. All right, so thank you so much for the introduction. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about my role uh, in the Mars 2020 mission, which is planetary protection, as well as end of on a note of how you can participate, how you can feel involved and be involved uh, in this entire process. So first, what is planetary protection? So the discipline of planetary protection has two different elements. When we explore other bodies in the solar system, like Mars, we have to make sure that we're doing it in a way that prevents any inadvertent Earth source microbial contamination, so our bugs, <laughs> from spreading to the place that we're exploring. Um, I love comparing it to the National Park Leave No Trace mantra. So not only is it the right thing to do, but when we analyze samples on Mars, we can be much more confident that the signal that we did find did in fact come from Mars and not from some contamination that we brought along the way. So the second aspect, if you can see the arrow going back from Mars to Earth, to the Earth, is called back contamination. So when we bring samples back, we have to make sure that it's done in a way that protects the Earth's biosphere. So how do we implement this discipline when we build spacecraft? One of the most noticeable things that we do, especially if you had a chance to visit JPL and the spacecraft assembly facility, is we assemble the spacecraft in a clean room. That means that there are no more than a certain limited amount of particles allowed in this room. So at JPL, we have the big SAF, Spacecraft Assembly Facility, is a class 10,000 clean room, which means that there is no more than 10,000 particles per square foot within the clean room that's greater than 0.5 microns. So in a normal air, just for comparison, it, there's about a million particles. So you can see how much cleaner this environment is. We're also constantly wiping down the spacecraft surfaces and all the exposed parts that you see to make sure that anything that settles on the surface is whisked away. So these trusted practices are tried and true, but you know, trust but verify. So you can see in this photo on the right, that the swabs that we're using here, um, they're collecting samples so that we can analyze it in the lab and understand what may be on the surface of the spacecraft. Um, and these swabs and wipes are actually sterilized. We have these autoclaves here. Um, they're sterilized so that when we take a sample and we measure what comes from it, we're very sure, 100% certain, right? That whatever signal that we get directly came from the spacecraft and not from our sampling tools. Um, and then the last thing I want to point out is that we are also in these white garments here. Uh, they're called bunny suits, uh, because if you were to ask me what the number one source of contamination is, or the, the number one threat to the spacecraft, it's humans. <laughs> we are a, a petri dish of uh, wonderful microbes that we need to grow and survive and thrive, but not so good for the spacecraft. So the bunny suit, the masks, the gloves, and all of those protections allow us to build the spacecraft while keeping it clean. Uh, another example that you see here of planetary protection in action uh, is this rover. So the rover right now that you can see, it's in the stow configuration. The stow configuration is the, the stacked up configuration that it's in while it's stacked underneath the descent stage. And this is the configuration that it, it preserves all the way through launch, uh, all the way through landing, right at, until the sky crane lowers it down. So this here is a picture of us conducting some CG tests uh, to make sure that all of these, uh, the, the calculations are correct. And we wanna make sure that the most critical surfaces that you see here uh, that will touch the surface of Mars, like the wheels, stay clean. And so a lot of these items, so let me highlight these, 
Um, so these areas that you see highlighted in yellow are things that we do for planetary protection to make sure these surfaces stay clean. So the wheels have these Amerstat covers that we keep on until the very last minute, right before the heat shield goes on, we take it off and then we're able to do that final mate. Um, there's also this, uh, in the middle here, you can see that's the big carousel. It's a literal carousel <laughs> filled with all the different types of bits that we're bringing to Mars. And it's HEPA filtered, it's sealed with a HEPA filter so that we can depressurize as we leave the Earth's atmosphere and repressurize as we go into the Martian atmosphere without adding contamination to these very clean entities. Um, and then the last part I want to point out here, this is the coring drill. And you can see here, these are stabilizing uh, portions. So you can imagine when you're drilling something at home, you want to stabilize it so that you can make sure that you drill a nice straight hole. Uh, and the same thing here, as we're taking a core sample, we want to make sure we're stabilized. So this is going to touch the surface of Mars. And so this is also kept under wraps until the very last minute. So years before the rover is even leaves the surface, a group of scientists and engineers and contamination experts um, like myself come together and we make sure that we build the hardware, we make a plan to build the hardware to keep it as clean as possible, um, especially the parts that will contact the, the Martian soil and take the, and collect those samples. So this picture that you see, is just really exciting to me every time I see this photo because this picture was taken as that happens to be me <laughs> as I was collecting the sample minutes before we put the deployable belly pan on to this uh, adaptive cache of a, a caching assembly. So it's basically the lower belly of the rover. And this once this cover goes on, it is never to be opened until uh, two days from now, <laughs> once we land on the surface of Mars, one of the first commissioning activities is actually to drop this belly pan. So minutes before that belly pan was finally added, this snapshot was taken. Um, so you can see in this picture, I'm taking a swab of the uh, surface of the outside there of the picture frame. And we've taken over 16,000 samples uh, on the entire spacecraft to make sure that the spacecraft is clean enough. And a good chunk came from these portions that you see here today in, in this picture, because it's the most critical parts. So of those you know, over 16,000 samples that we took, about 57% are spacecraft samples. We also took about 35% of those samples were facility samples. Um, you can imagine you're walking on the floor, you're touching the walls. You have to make sure those areas are clean. Um, similarly, we take samples of the tables. Uh, imagine you're putting something together. You have to rest your part on a table. Um, so we have to make sure those things are clean. So we, we're fortunate that uh, everything actually turned out to be extremely clean. We came in at under, we set a goal and we were far below that goal. Um, and we we're also fortunate that based on the way we assembled these spacecraft, um, with our, especially what you see there, we are wearing sterile garments, sterile goggles when we interact with these parts. Um, so even with the COVID-19 pandemic, we actually didn't have to change anything with the way we build the spacecraft uh, because it was just so resilient even to COVID-19. So just to give you an idea of what we do when we collect the sample, we take it and we grow it in a Petri dish and we understand what specifically is on uh, the spacecraft surface. And then we take that and we actually freeze the microbe that we find, the, uh, the microbes that we find across the entire mission. And it's funny because since planetary protection was first developed, uh, we actually, then that was during the Viking times, we have isolates, these microbes that we froze all the way from Viking till today. So it's amazing how many little critters we have in a freezer uh, on, on lab. <laughs> but the, the detriment or the, the shortfall of this particular method is that it really depends on uh, if you're hungry, right? If you like a particular kind of food, then you're going to eat it. But microbes can be picky and they may not like the food that you give it. So not all microbes may grow. So to combat that, we also, for the first time, officially took DNA samples as part of the official strategy. So basically we uh, 23 and need <laughs> about a thousand of the samples that we collected. 
uh, and to understand what is there, uh, what specifically uh, DNA-wise is on our spacecraft. And the reason why this is really important is because, as Randy mentioned, this is the first leg of a sample return mission. And so we want to make sure that whatever we maybe might have sent out there is on what we call a passenger list. And if when we bring the samples back and we see, hmm, there's something in there that looks kind of familiar, but uh, and we fi commonly find it in our clean room, then we could say, aha, that might be contamination. So the, the 23andMe equivalent of, of uh, what we do on our food trap comes in very handy. And this is a great segue into public engagement. <laughs> so just to, to get you all involved, I mean, first of all, you're here, you're listening to this talk, and I really appreciate the excitement that you have uh, to join us today. Um, but one other thing that I do want to point out is in this upper right-hand corner, so we have, we have the opportunity to do a lot of these great engagement activities with schools, with hospitals, uh, with all types of entities. But in this upper right-hand corner, this is Alexander Mather uh, and Veniza Rupani, and they are the two people Alexander named the rover, Perseverance, and Veniza named the helicopter, Ingenuity. So just remember that the next time NASA has a mission that we're launching, please put your name in and suggest a, a possible name for the rover or for the next mission. You could be the person that names it. And if you're also excited about this mission and you wanna know how do you design your own uh, rover system or your own Mars mission, there's actually a mission to Mars challenge. It's a five week educational plan. You can still sign up um, and really you can just go design your mission all the way through landing. They're actually on the landing module this week, but you can join at any time and be your own NASA scientist. And just to end, uh, like Randy said, this is the first leg of a, of a round trip mission. And let's hope that one of you watching today, especially the younger ones, that you're this person right here on the right side. You might be the first person, the first astronaut to go to Mars. So this is the first step in a very long leg of, of possibly having humans on Mars. So you could be that person. And with that, I'm going to kick it back over to Representative Holden. Well, thank you. Uh, it, outstanding presentation. And, you know, there's certainly a lot of information there to really get. You, both of you have presented this in such a way where it certainly demystifies a lot of what this represents and, and, and gives some really behind the scenes understandings. We have a number of questions that have come in that we picked up over the last week or so. Um, and so I'm going to call their name and I'm just going to read their question and give you a chance to both uh, weigh in as you see fit. Um, we have uh, Jodan uh, from Pasadena, and he's asking, or it's, it's being asked, how many people were involved in developing and building the rover? And was it all done in-house? And the last part of the three-part question, and are they getting nervous? <laughs> Yeah, so I can I can take that question uh, unless Randy, do you, do you know the yep. exact number? I don't have yeah, I don't have the exact, exact number, people, but um, I I can tell you that there are people not only at JPL but there are vendors that we actually had to work with not only all around the United States. I can name almost uh, in every single state which company provided some sort of instrument or expertise to help in this endeavor. But what's more, uh, even more heartening is that it's an international effort. There are several of the instruments that Randy was talking about, uh, one of which came from Spain, uh, Meta. Um, we have uh, another, Rimfax came from Norway. Uh, we have Supercam came from uh, France. So it is an international endeavor. It took thousands of people. So don't look at just us two people here as the mouthpieces. It took thousands of people. <laughs> Very good. Um, this kind of dovetails into a little bit of that uh, answer. Uh, Paula from Altadena, uh, your neighbor, I think, probably in Altadena. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about Mars's missions from other space agencies around the world, uh, whether other agencies have sent rovers or other landers, et cetera? I can take this one. Yeah. Um, Mars is not the domain of any one country. 
So there have been a number of countries that have sent both swing bys, where you go by the world, orbiters, landers, and rovers. Uh, Mars has been particularly difficult. It, it's really more than 50% of the things that try to land there fail. But uh, Russia has sent a number of spacecraft. Japan has sent spacecraft. The European Space Agency uh, has. I'm sure I'm forgetting a bunch, but the ones that just went there on this launch opportunity, because you can only launch at certain times because we're not smart enough to build stronger rockets. The United Arab Emirates, uh, UAE, just sent a, their first Mars mission, and it's in orbit successfully. And China has sent their vehicle, which just got into orbit also, uh, uh, the Chinese vehicle is not only an orbiter, but it has a lander and it has a rover too. So we're really excited that other people are joining us there and we wish them the best of luck. All right. Uh, we have a question from Randall. It's a three-parter. Um, and the three-part question is, does a moon base need to be established first to launch a higher percentage success rate mission? And what is a realistic timeline for a moon base being established with or without a moon base? What is the current lifeline for a manned mission to Mars? Okay. Um, Mo, I'm gonna take a shot at this. Please. <laughs> okay. Let's see if I can remember everything. First, in order to get rockets uh, to be more success successful and have a better launch rate, basically you just have to do it over and over again. So initially you fail. If you look at SpaceX, they were blowing up Falcon 9s all the time. And now they're just launching them, returning them and landing them. It just seems routine now. So the trick to getting something reliable is just doing it a large number of launches. It has nothing to do about the destination. If you had people on the moon and you were going there all the time, that's another way to have a bunch of launch vehicles, but you just need to launch them all the time to get good at it. Uh, the next question about having a lunar base, when are we gonna do that? Um, it's all about funding. So if you told me what NASA's funding was every year, I would tell you when we would do it. The current plan, which I don't think is current anymore, is they wanted to launch something by 2024 to the moon, but I, I don't think that's realistic. But I would expect sometime in the 2020s to have humans return to the moon. Hopefully the first one will be a woman, which would be great. Um, but uh, let's see, what was the third question? When is the lunar base frequency? Uh, it says with or without, let's see. Um, yeah, in terms of the percentage success rate mission and what is a realistic timeline for a moon base being established. And then the third, with or without a moon base, what is the current timeline for a manned mission to Mars, which I think you okay. kind well, of alluded just to. Well, answer that one. Um, First of all, we don't say manned. We say human missions these days, just to be sensitive. Right, right. Um, there are two different approaches. One says you should go to the moon, establish a base there, just so how you can learn how to live off Earth. And if something goes bad, you're only three days away. That, that's not too bad to get back and forth. The other group says, no, why are you spending all this time on the moon? Let's go to Mars. Mars is normally 11 months away. Most of our missions do it in like seven or eight. Um, humans, you'd like to do it for six months, but that's not until the 2030s or 40s if the U.S. and other countries want to do that. Very good. Um, let's see, we've got a question from Tony from Pasadena. He wants to know, what is the operational life expectancy of most instruments on Perseverance? Yeah, I can take that. Uh, the At least in general for the uh, entire mission, it's supposed to last for a Martian year. So two, two Earth years. And likely because we're there are a bunch of smart engineers <laughs> that design with a bunch of margin, uh, likely it's going to last far longer than the uh, prime mission timeline, which is one Martian year. And look at Curiosity. It's been going for nine years. It also was a, a Mars year mission. Exactly. So it's a, it's very possible that it could be, but two years is what's kind of expected to be. It's the, the minimum, right? The minimum. Right. Gotcha. 
Um, question from Deborah. Where does the launch take place? How long does it take for the rover to reach Mars? I think you might have touched on that mm -hmm. one. Is the rover on its own once it's launched or is it directed, controlled in real time by scientists? Um, how about I'll start and you finish. Uh, okay. We launch from Cape Canaveral at the Kennedy Space Center, which is on the east coast of Florida. Uh, we go direct out. We said it was about seven months for perseverance. Everyone is a little bit different depending on the opportunity. Um, robots, um, we're not really good with uh, automation yet. We're getting there and we'd like to be able to have it do self-rule, but the way these spacecraft work is we give it a set of instructions with a, a time to do it. You know, at this time, do this. At this time, do this. At this time, do this. And we send up command loads to the spacecraft for the, the vehicle to execute. So basically, it's not on its own. It's doing everything by itself. But we painstakingly generate a sequence of events that we transmit to the vehicle that is dutifully just executing, executing one, one command at a time. Mm -hmm. And if it gets into trouble, it has a couple of routines of, of what to do if there's trouble. Yeah, and if I may add, uh, so in order to have a signal travel from Mars to Earth, the one-way light time kind of varies, but it's around 10, 11 minutes. So imagine if you're trying to use a joystick to land a rover, if you don't know what it's doing, if there's a delay of 11 minutes, it's really difficult to, to do that, which is why, as Randy said, we have that executed set of commands that it does on its own. Very good. Ava from Pasadena. My seven-year-old son, Jack, is asking, will you be searching for alien life on Mars? <laughs> yeah, I can take that. <laughs> so in a sense, uh, yes, we'll be searching for alien life. Um, the thing is, we expect to find uh, extinct, ancient microbial life uh, on the surface of Mars. Uh, and, and, and yeah, that's the ultimate goal. We have Sherlock and Pixel, uh, really great instruments that are gonna tell us a lot about the geology and the biosignatures and really give us a good idea about what we're looking at before we acquire a sample. Because as, as Randy said, we only have a limited amount of tubes. We only have 43 tubes of which 30 are coming back. So you have to be really certain that whatever site you pick to sample, that it's gonna be a good one. And, and let me just add to that. When we, when we say looking for aliens, let's be real here. We don't believe it's cows and sheep and dogs, Martian cows and sheep and dogs. It's a single cell kind of thing. So this is not gonna come out and greet us and shake hands. It's, these, are, these are single cells that if there was life are probably dead, but we yes. always hope that maybe there would be life there. Very cool. Well, when you showed the, um, the fact that clearly at one point there was oceans on the planet, um, you know, that's <laughs> potentially, yeah, that, that, oh, yeah, that's yeah, sort yeah. of an indication that, you know, we obviously aren't the only planet uh, to have an ocean or water uh, element that's part of our, uh, our makeup, that at one point anyway, Mars could have been another. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, one of the challenges is we're very self-centered. We used to go, we're the center of the universe. No, the sun is. Well, okay, our sun is special. No, it really isn't. Well, life on Earth is special. And we'll see how long we can hold on to that. And when you find life somewhere, go, well, we, we're multicellular. And then when you find multicellular, you go, oh, well, we're intelligent. And we just, keep, it's, it's called the mediocrity <laughs> principle. We keep getting knocked lower and lower and lower of this exceptional status we assign for ourselves. Also known as a wake-up call. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's the amazing thing, though, about uh, the location, this landing site, because we really set ourselves up for success. I mean, go if you go to the nearest pond or the nearest lake and you dredge up the bottom, you're going to find a lot of life, a diverse uh, plethora of life. So if something used to exist there, we're, we're going to find it. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, that's exciting in and of itself. Uh, let's see, we have a, a question from Greg. Uh, this has a little bit more uh, technical comments in it. Uh, given that Mars is between three and 22 light minutes away from Earth, and because of this automation, because this automation 
has always been an important factor in designing Mars probes, but because of the need for reliability in a harsh environment, a hardened power PC 750, I guess you'll know what that means, yeah. um, and a, uh, a BAE or BAE was chosen. So where the programming team, were the, so were the programming team able to incorporate any artificial intelligence into this older processor to facilitate better autonomous operation? Uh, I'll start this one. Um, yeah, the, the 750 is basically the brain of this vehicle and it's very old. I mean, we've been using these for 20, 30 years now. Um, we don't want to put too much AI on a spacecraft because it's tough to spend large amounts of money and then just trust it to do the right thing. We get nervous about that. But there are some autonomous functions that we've put on the vehicle so that uh, it can do things on its own, autonomy, self-rule. So when it's coming in to Mars on Thursday, it has photographs of its landing location from our orbiting spacecraft. And it's gonna compare photographs it takes of the ground to this photograph to figure where it is and we said of this Jezero crater and this Delta region, here are some safe regions. So the vehicle on its own gonna go, gee, I'm here, there's the closest safe region. I'm gonna go over there and actually direct itself. It also can choose when to shoot out its parachute based on the speed it's going and the distance from the target. And then it just has a bunch of routines on there that if something bad happens, what to do. As an example, if your receiver dies, how do you command the spacecraft to go to your backup receiver if your primary receiver is dead? Well, we have, it's not a kitchen timer on this thing that's set for like eight days. And if the vehicle doesn't get a command, it goes, ah, my receiver's dead. I'm going to switch to my backup. And then it waits another eight days. And if it doesn't get something, it does half the primary, half the backup. And it just starts swapping things in and out until either it hears from us or it dies. So that is a type of autonomy. It's taking care of itself. Yeah, and if I may add, at least the one part that uh, Randy mentioned, the terrain relative navigation that allows us to compare the picture of the ground with the, all the safe landing locations. If we did not have that technology, we would not be able to land in such a cool site. It, in the past, if you look at the, pri the previous landing sites, it had to be an open, wide, flat area because it, it's difficult. It's tough to land on Mars, period. But now that we have this technology, we can land in such a cool place like Jezero Crater. That's exciting. Well, you know, um, like we talked about earlier, just because you've all, uh, highlighted the fact that it's hard to land on, on the planet and then to be able to do it with such precision, it's, that's quite the accomplishment in and of itself. There's a, a question from Marvin that says, okay, what is the end game? Um, suppose we find evidence of past microbial life there, then what? I know the questions of are we alone would be answered, but wouldn't resources, financial and technological, be better spent trying to find Earth 2.0 and contacting that star system? Uh, Moo, do you want to start or you want me to start? Why don't you start? Because I just love the picture you paint. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, first, about looking for life on Mars. Yeah, there's the question about are you alone, but the really cool set of questions you get to ask. If you found life on Mars or fossilized life on Mars, then you get to ask the next set of questions. Did life start on Earth and jump to Mars? Usually it would be like an impact that would knock rocks up that would go, we call uphill. Or did life start on Mars and go downhill to Earth? Or are they completely independent that you had two different genesis in one solar system? If you had independent life forming in two different places in one solar system, it means life is all over the place. So mm -hmm. that's one of the cool things about this. Your question about looking for Earth 2.0, um, God, uh, exoplanets are really, really far away. And the way I describe it is, the Voyager spacecraft that I started my career on is doing a million miles every day, which I think isn't too shabby. At a million miles per day to go to the nearest star, which we don't know if it has a, an Earth 2.0, but we think it has an exoplanet, 
That would take 72,000 years. Now, maybe you could do it remotely, but we are babes in the woods here, guys. We are just, you know, we're hardly out of the curb, you know, leaving our house. So what we're first trying to do is just conclusively figure out, do we have life here on Earth? Uh, in our, we do have life here on Earth, in our solar system, and there are just a number of great places to look. We have ocean worlds, moons, and asteroids and planets that look like they have subterranean oceans. If you got oceans, you got the water, they're wet because something is keeping them wet, and organics, carbon hydrogen are everywhere. So let's start here first. Yeah, I completely Moon. agree. And, and to add to the whole uh, Earth 2.0 part, I mean, it, I agree with Randy, right? Things are so far away. Also, it's really difficult. I, I hear a lot of people talking about terraforming. That's hard. <laughs> <laughs> That's hard. It's expensive. It's, it'll take a long time. And it just builds your appreciation for how precious our own Earth is. Uh, so yeah, just it's a great reminder that Earth-like things are hard to make and they're hard to access. <laughs> so treasure, treasure what you have. Very good. You know, and you think we're technologically advanced to make electricity on this planet, we boil water. Let's just keep things <laughs> in perspective, okay? Right, right. <laughs> that does kind of put it into perspective. Um, Sean asked the question, considering the discussions that Elon Musk and SpaceX have brought up, what does the timeline look like for us potentially starting a civilization? I think you maybe talked a little bit about that on Mars and what companies are helping with your exploration efforts? Oh yeah. man. <laughs> there's, there's hundreds of companies. I mean, because if you think about it, every spacecraft has subsystems. Think, think of boxes that do things. Every subsystem has computers and boards and electronics. Every computer board and electronics have components. These are all built by different people, not only around the US, all over the place. If you just look at aerospace companies, besides Boeing and Lockheed Martin and um, keep going, General Dynamics, um, Rocketdyne, uh, SpaceX, there's, there's just tons of them. Mm -hmm. It's a business. It's the next generation. It's, it's the space commerce. And it's great that uh, these entities exist because they'll they'll do it uh, fast and cheap, and we can focus at least on the NASA end on doing things that push the envelope of science that may not be profitable, but just really fulfill our curiosity to search for more. And let so me right just add now, one to that one other thing. Uh -huh. um, for all your audience that's watching this, I used to say twenty years, but now it's probably closer to ten. In 10 years, there'll be low, there'll be low Earth orbiting hotels in space. Initially, mm -hmm. it's going to be pretty expensive, but you're going to have hotels in space in less than around 10 years. And everybody that's youngsters on your WebEx here, they'll be able to tell their grandchildren, quote, I remember looking at the moon and remembering when there were no city lights on it. Close quote. Wow. <laughs> But you're giving us something to really think about in a, in a, in a, in a way that uh, I'm probably sure most haven't. Uh, it's so literally outside the box. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and, and in that same vein, James uh, sends in a question, will facilities be constructed above or below the surface of Mars and will solar and wind be used for power? Hydronic farming uh, for food. Yeah, um, as far as constructing things. So funny enough, uh, you've seen in the movies, right? There are uh, these habitats that are constructed above the surface. But in talking to some of my uh, geology friends, some uh, a, a hypothesis that I've never heard before until I spoke to her, she mentioned that one of the safest places for uh, long duration astronauts to stay is in some of the, the natural lava tubes that exist. It's nice and protected. You have a, this nice little sun lamp, <laughs> right? It's the, those lava tubes, those old lava tubes are actually really useful. Um, so yeah, that would require no real construction, maybe some retrofitting, but uh, that's what I would imagine as a feasible, sustainable way to habitat, to have to, yeah, to go on Mars. <laughs> Randy, <laughs> you look like you and, wanna add something. <laughs> and lava, well, I always talk, sorry. 
<laughs> Lava tubes also control temperature and they protect you from meteorite, uh, meteor bombardments. Um, as the last thing is, he was referring to hydroponics where rather than planting plants in soil and watering it, you have tubes that you fill with water and nutrient and you just put the seeds in and they grow out of the tubes. But that got, you know, water's kind of heavy. So the next level they're talking about is having tubes that are just filled with high humidity air. So just water vapor. So it's a lot less water, a lot less weight, but you can still nourish the plants. So we're looking into a lot of those things. Cool. Christine asks, uh, will this rover have the NASA imprint on its tires to leave the tracks path <laughs> of the rover on Mars? Ooh, like the Michelin, will, will it leave a Michelin? To, no, I'm just <laughs> so we won't have that. Everybody knows about the imprint. Yeah, on the yeah, 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 yeah. So guess what? We don't have that anymore. <laughs> um, there are some Easter eggs. I will say that, and that's all about all I can say. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure the the full of it'll be strategically released what these Easter eggs are, but no no markings on the treads. I'll say that. Very cool. Well. <laughs> I, I wanted to, um, we have a, just a little bit of time left, um, but I thought it might be good if you, the two of you maybe kind of closed out with some parting thoughts that you thought were important for us to, to kind of take away that we didn't cover tonight uh, that sort of gives us an understanding. I think you talked about the importance of the mission. Um, you talked about the, the technology that gets us there, um, what we're expecting to find and, and what the research will hopefully reveal. Are there any other thoughts that you have around this mission? Um, so when people are tuning in on Thursday and they're actually watching the landing that, you know, here's something that maybe it's even, you know, I think you talked a little bit about this in your last answer about um, did life start on Mars and make its way to Earth or Earth to Mars or were they independent? that also has sort of a, an interesting um, uh, reflection on creation, right? In terms of, uh, you know, if you're really thinking about this, I remember in um, CNN did this story, uh, did this uh, documentary on 1968 and the moon mission as it came on the, from on the dark side of the moon. And it was so riveting. And with all the drama that took place in 1968 to end that year, was something to celebrate, something to be really excited about and feel like, wow, there is something bigger than us that we can focus on in our, in our mundane issues and problems. And so when they saw the, um, the earth rising on the other side of the sun, which that had never been seen by human eyes before, that created a whole different perspective that the rest of the world had a chance to embrace as well. Are we gonna have that kind of a moment um, or something similar to that. Uh, I know this isn't the first time to Mars, but are, is there something that we can sort of exhale when we see it that, that's gonna really cause us to just feel like, wow, you know what? You know, there's, we are really small in the universe, but there's something grand out there that we can embrace and be a part of as well. Moo, you wanna start? <laughs> I'll start because I know you're gonna close it fantastically. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so at least for me, I mean, as a kid, my, my inner child, my inner middle schooler who got turned on to, to space and exploration, always wondered, are we alone in, in the universe? And, and like you highlighted, this will help us answer that question. And with the detection instruments that's on the surface of, of Mars, that will be on the surface of Mars in a couple of days, That'll give us an indication of what might be there. But the really cool thing is you can exhale and say, we landed and this is now the beginning of collecting samples so that we can bring it back and interrogate it with the best instruments that we have on Earth. And a lot of the people that are watching today, I'm sure some of you would be able to look at these Martian cores. Uh, in the past, it was all kind of at random, whatever was ejected from Mars and landed on Earth is what we got for our Mars sample return mission. Now this is a targeted sample return and the beginning of just a wonderful set of discoveries that, that you all can be a part of. Very cool. Yeah. And I'm gonna take this in a little bit different direction. Um, some people go, why do we do space exploration? 
And the fundamental answer is to learn. And learning has two components. It's getting the information. So that's why we explore and we learn and we do research and teaching and passing it on. So when you, when you think about learning, well, hey, if I had a deserted island with a bunch of people that could take whatever they want, but they can't learn, they'll die. If I have another island with people that have nothing, but they can learn, those guys will go to the stars. So I ask you, which island do you want to be on? All about learning. All about learning. Well, we, we appreciate uh, both of you joining us this evening. And we know that we had um, parents, a lot of people who were participating tonight, um, who were very fascinated by uh, space and travel and what we're doing and certainly the role that JPL plays in that. Um, but we also know there's some parents, you know, who are homeschooling during this pandemic. And this created another opportunity to expand learning options and opportunity to hear from the two of you and talk about something real time, uh, but is in the science realm that I'm sure has sparked their uh, imagination and creative thinking. And so, you know, just being a part of that experience and knowing that you uh, have bring so much uh, to bear in terms of your scientific thinking, but just your humanity and your thinking about the larger value to uh, to humanity and to people and our way of life and a lot of what we're talking about today you know who knows what gets discovered out of all of this that sets the stage for 50 or 100 years from now um, and for people who are not even born yet to to be able to benefit from and to see the the advances that it, it, it opens the door to so um, we're just incredibly appreciative. Uh, we're not going to say that this is going to be the first and only time that we will have this chance to, to have this kind of format for conversation. Um, this uh, important mission has, as we look forward to tuning in live uh, for the landing scheduled for this Thursday, February the 18th, with NASA TV beginning coverage at 11.15 a.m. Standard Pacific Time. And so that will be Kind of this is all leading up to that day and to that time and you know with your with your animated uh you know depiction of what the landing is going to look like and the and the and the process and the segments that it goes through before it hits the ground lands on the ground i shouldn't say hit the ground but lands is um it's, it's something that's in our minds and it gives us a certain understanding of what this is all about and so again we want to thank you for being with us this evening uh sharing your thoughts and your insights and getting us ready for the Mars landing. Perseverance. Go perseverance. <laughs> Go perseverance. And you know, that's an interesting uh, perseverance. No, we didn't ask the question. The name perseverance. Why perseverance? Yeah. It means Process so much. that you had to persevere through, huh? Yes. <laughs> Especially with the team at the very end, we were building the spacecraft and getting it to the pad through this global pandemic. So perseverance is fitting. Well, Moo, maybe you fitting. want to explain why the name Perseverance and how it was oh, chosen? Yeah. Yes. So uh, Alexander Mather uh, actually uh, made that, they picked that name. He wrote an essay. So a, I forgot which grade he's in, but a, a kid that is, that is probably the age of many of the kids out there named our rover. And boy, did he do a great job. And you said that you're creating an opportunity for kids to be a part of naming future yes. missions Every, as well. Yes, please check it out. Go to NASA's page as soon as you hear <laughs> that the naming contest is open. We every rover has been named uh, by a, um, a I think elementary, middle, a kindergarten through twelfth grade. You can enter the contest. And when we send a mission to another world, usually about a year before. We have a website where you can type in your name and we will etch everybody's names onto a chip, put it on the vehicle and launch it. So for this one, we almost had 11 million names. I mean, it's like more wow. than Greece. So <laughs> if, even if you don't want to write an essay or name a spacecraft, if you want your name or your parents' name to go on a vehicle, wait for the next mission that's blasting off a year before you have it assembled, go to the NASA page, type in your name, and we'll put your name on our spacecraft. Yep. Dr. Wesson, Dr. Cooper, 
you're amazing. Thank you for being with us this afternoon, this evening. And we look forward to having more time to visit with you after we witness the, the landing and have a chance to review it and see your data come in. And maybe there's some additional comments that you can share with us at that point. Awesome. Sounds good. Our we'll be looking here. forward to the helicopter flight next. There you go. <laughs> All right. Have, enjoy the 